Is Hurricane Hillary really just an inside job orchestrated by the writer's strike? And also, let's discuss the absurdity of Johnny Manziel's story. Welcome to episode 17 of Alternative Jargon. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Alternative Jargon, episode number 17. Before I start today's podcast, I'd like to apologize to my tens of fans out there for the lack of podcasts the last couple weeks. I had to move back into college, so as you can see, we are back in the studio from a few months ago. The same room, same place, different camera setup. I have my room set up differently uh, this time. I have to switch things up once in a while. So, you know, Hurricane Hillary is going absolutely insane in California right now. Uh, there's like never, ever hurricanes over there. Sort of weird. I saw a picture of Dodger Stadium underwater, basically. I don't know if it was real or if uh, ChatGPT did it. Who really knows? Um, there was no community note under the tweet, so I have no idea if it's real. But yeah, I mean, very odd to see a hurricane in that part of the country. And I, I really want to know how long it's going to take Trump to utilize this um, to make jokes during one of his rallies and really fire up the crowd. I mean, he could... He could really turn this into something good. He's got to fire up that 2024 campaign a little bit. Um, I mean, also, when is his mugshot going to come out? Because that'll be an album cover. That'll be great. But, you know, I want to see Trump get up there and really rile up his base with some Hurricane Hillary jokes. Okay. Frankly, Hurricane Hillary may be doing as much damage to California as the radical left policies that they have in place there. Okay. So much, so many things he could say. All right. Well, you look at the storm. It's coming in crooked. It's hitting the coast, frankly, very crooked. Almost as crooked as crooked Hillary. Okay. Look, I know that uh, it's been a few years since she lost the election, but we all know that there's still, uh, that's still a bitter rivalry. It's still very better between the two. Um, you know, but this Hillary is spelled different. Maybe that's why he hasn't um, hopped on to this yet. But I wrote a joke for that, too. Um, so I want to see the Don get up there and go, you know, um, a lot of people are saying that the name of the storm only has one L. Because Hillary Clinton took the first L in 2016. Millions of people, frankly. I mean, the jokes write themselves. He needs to get on this. I know that she is not his opponent in 2024. But nonetheless, um, he's got to make fun of his losers and haters. And Don, are you falling off? Because, I don't know, someone on his staff needs to be like, dude... You've just got, like, three years' worth of material out of the name of a hurricane. But anyway, on the flip side, um, how long will it take Hillary Clinton to utilize the storm to help her step in for Joe Biden in 2024? Because are we really going to put Joe Biden back in there for four more years? Who knows? But, you know... Hillary's 2024 campaign slogan, uh, 2016, don't worry, it was just the calm before the storm. Okay, Hillary, 2024, the perfect storm, right? Hillary, 2024, category four in real life, but category one in our hearts. They could, uh, you know, both of these people have some mic drop moments to um, create out of this situation. And I hate seeing stuff like this not get utilized because it needs to get utilized. Um, and another thing is, I think it's a little bit odd that this hurricane decides to, you know, storm the shores right 
during the writer's strike, right during the actor's strike. Uh, Coincidence? I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay. And there was just an earthquake in Southern California as well. Open, put, put on your thinking caps, people. Think outside the box. Okay. Think outside the box, but think inside Los Angeles County. This is all being orchestrated. Okay. The actors and writers um, put together a nice little cabal, and now they are just going in on the studio heads. All right. We all know that there's some dark magic type people over there in Hollywood. It's common knowledge at this point. I think that the earthquake and the Hurricane Hillary are actually brought to you by and conjured up by SAG AFTRA. Is that how you say it? SAG AFTRA. It's all an inside job, okay? Right now, SAG is in their bag, okay? The studio heads are just getting wiped like a rag by SAG right now, okay? They better watch out because next are frag grenades courtesy of SAG, all right? On Twitter, they're getting dragged for wronging SAG. And don't be surprised if SAG unloads a mag on the studios, all right? SAG is raising their flags in Hollywood. And when the war is over, SAG might just have to brag. All right, I'm done. I'm done. I kind of just wanted to bring up the writer strike because I think the name of the, uh, what's it called? The union is funny. Okay. I, I can't take your strike seriously when every time you say your name, I think about, um, geriatric male genitalia. I just can't do it. Change the name. More people will be on board. Heck, the studios might start backing you again. Okay. Um, But until then, I might be on the studio's side, right? Replace these people with AI until they can come up with a better name. I don't need that image in my head every time you say your name. Okay. Okay. Let's not talk about saggy things, okay? Let's not talk about sag. Can we drop sag from our vocabulary? But anyway, yeah, it's weird that there's a hurricane over there. Weird stuff going on. But, uh, you know, in, uh, in other news, the Johnny Manziel documentary, Untold, just came out on Netflix a couple weeks ago. I was really interested to watch it. Um, I remember Manziel Mania back when I was like in elementary school. It was one of the craziest things I've ever seen in sports. And I needed to watch the documentary, not only to get some new facts about it, but also, you know, I was 10 years old when he was doing all that stuff pretty much. So I didn't quite know what was going on. I knew he was good at football and I knew he liked parties, but that was probably back when I thought parties had Doritos and birthday cake at them. Okay. I didn't know Johnny football was rail and lines of Coke before practice back then. I thought maybe he just really liked birthday cake, but I mean, he probably does like birthday cake, but yeah, it was really good though. Um, and I have to say, I'm on, I'm on Johnny's side with the whole autograph signing thing. This is obviously before college athletes were allowed to make money on their likeness and things like that. And he was just, you know, exercising the free market, making money off of his fame and his football skills. And obviously it was against the NCAA rules, but... I don't blame him for it. He was absolutely stacking the money and hats off to him for that. So, but yeah, man, he was, I think he was on top of the world at maybe the coolest time to ever be on top of the world. This was a time like 2011 to 2013 or 14. It was a time 
when social media existed, but it wasn't what it is today. It was still very fun, original, not, you know, completely corporatized like it is now. Um, you know, every picture he's in while he's partying, he's wearing like a Miami Heat snapback. You know, him and his buddies were rocking Nike Elite socks with trashy Ocean City boardwalk attire. And <laughs> frankly, that that's just some of the best stuff we've ever seen. Okay, if I could bring back any of the dumb style trends, I think I would go back to like 2012. Everything just looked so tacky, but in like a somehow a good way, I guess. But I mean, the music back then was perfect for partying. Everything was just EDM, right? You'd hear the most depressing lyric of your life followed by the, you know, an ear blasting bass drop. It was a fun time. And one thing I didn't realize is I knew that he was famous like for football, I knew that he was famous, definitely in College Station, stuff like that. I never realized, though, that Johnny Manziel was meeting like A-list celebrities everywhere he went, okay? He has a picture with everyone. This guy met everyone. Everyone, and we're not talking little guys. This guy was, he was everywhere, meeting everyone, okay? He has a picture with Drake before Drake was grooming girls. Talk about an OG. That is crazy, okay? Before Drake was like praying on Millie Bobby Brown, he was praying on Johnny Manziel, all right? But that tells you, you know, first of all, how long ago that was. Drake still looked like a little kid. Um, but yeah. And also the part in the documentary where he's really trying to get drafted and his agent basically like is hiding Johnny Manziel from the world and trying to keep him contained in a cage just so he can get drafted. That was crazy. I mean, this guy to get drafted in the NFL had to like do solitary confinement just because he wanted to party so bad. And I want to know if, because his friends all said, you know, after football, you never heard him talk about football. Football was just a means to have an excuse to party and be famous. And I just wonder what was going through Johnny Manziel's head when like, he's got all these crazy opportunities to make so much money and have a great career right at his fingertips, but he kind of just throws it away to party. I just wonder if it's like, if it was like an impulse for him, like if he had any control. And I wonder if he was more addicted to like substances or to like being famous and going out and just being in the light, you know? That wasn't talked about too much in the documentary. I mean, obviously, he got checked into rehab and things like that, but I would have liked to hear more about what he had to say about that because that's always intrigued me for a guy who threw his life away in the NFL. Um, I feel like they don't they didn't talk too much about, I guess, yeah, his nature. I don't know, but... Anyway, yeah, um, and that the whole agent thing before the NFL draft made me think how many more athletes are just like that, but their agents keep it under wraps, you know? Um, like if Johnny Manziel didn't screw up that NFL opportunity, we probably would never have heard this story because it would be kept completely secret. But obviously his NFL career ended and now there's he's obviously never going to suit up for a team again. Um, so it can be released to the public. But uh, I think about like Antonio Brown back four years ago when he just out of nowhere snaps and goes crazy and starts 
wreaking havoc everywhere he goes. Everything he touches just turns to crap, it seems. Even though he did end up winning a Super Bowl. But, um, you know, did Antonio Brown just start acting like that out of nowhere? Or was it just kept hidden for so many years? Because before that ever happened... I didn't know I didn't really know anything about Antonio Brown. He was just a really good player. And that's it. Like so I I'm not a Steelers fan. I don't fo- I didn't follow them too closely, but I knew who he was and I never thought about him. So and then there's the theory that the uh Vontez Perfect hit gave him, you know, really bad mental issues and that's where it all started. Who really knows, but um, you know, I think if Johnny Manziel's draft situation happened today, uh, his agent would just pull him out of the draft and try and get him on board at Barstool Sports. And I think that that is where Johnny Manziel belongs. I think that would be perfect. Johnny Manziel is like the embodiment of Barstool Sports. Or, you know, something just loud and flagrant. That's what he needs. That's where he needs to be. Okay. Get him in his habitat. I think if he wanted, he could have a podcast sponsored by Barstool up and running in 24 hours. Okay. His agent would call Dave Portnoy on the phone and he would be flown into the Barstool office the next day, expedited shipping on Johnny Manziel. And he'd walk in, he'd sign a contract, shake hands with Portnoy and then they'd both rip like 10 lines. And he'd be at home. He'd be at home. Probably wouldn't be good for him. He probably wouldn't live more than a couple weeks in that office. Because he would be too... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? There'd be a lot of enablers around him. Morning, Johnny. You want the coffee or the beer? You know which one he's picking, okay? Okay. He would not last long in that office. And I also wonder, even if he was in a situation like that, where literally he has to come to work and be himself behind a microphone for an hour a week, he would probably lose that job too. He wouldn't show up. He would party. You know, the simplest things. I don't know if that guy could hold down anything. And I mean, I wish him well. Um... It was a really sad part of the documentary when after he got cut by the Browns, he just said, yeah, I, I just partied for a year, spent $5 million, and at the end of all that, my plan was to kill myself. Like, that's super depressing. Obviously hope that he never does that. But, um, you know, we need, to see, we need to see Johnny Football back doing something fun. We need to see him back doing something fun. I think the demand is still there. People are still intrigued by him. He's like 30 years old now. Um, kind of a depressing life that he's lived so far, just on paper. Just not good decisions here and there, everywhere. But I think he, he can redeem himself. I really do. And I think that starts by getting him on board at Barstool Sports. So... And I feel like that has to have been brought up before. Everyone knows the guy. Everyone knows his lifestyle. He'd be perfect there. And I can't believe that something like that has not already happened, to be honest. But if not Barstool, I I think he could fit in with the Nelk boys, too. Because what do those guys do? They have a cameraman follow them to a new location once a month, and they party and do drugs and drink and then sell merch. And all of their 12-year-old fans absolutely love them. I think Johnny Football could fit in there. Okay? They just tell him, Johnny, go party and we'll follow you with a camera. I I think that would be a huge moneymaker. Okay? Dana White would hit him up. He'd probably get a deal with UFC. You know, actually, come to think of it, I'm really surprised Johnny Manziel has not done any of the like celebrity boxing or anything yet. That surprises me because just look at the guy. He looks like he would do it. And just his personality, I could totally see him in the ring. 
I really could. Um, but anyway, yeah, I can't believe a deal hasn't been done with Johnny Manziel. And maybe it's because these companies and these people know that, yeah, he's, you know, keep the contract under three months because that we might not get him for longer than that. If that three months, who knows, but yeah. I, I always wonder too, and everyone wonders how good he would have been if he actually tried. And on paper, I think you can ask that question, but I think he's one of those guys where if he's not allowed to go party and stuff, then I don't think he would like function. I don't. Because I feel like a guy like that, like as unhealthy as the partying and substances are for him and his body that's like his thing okay it's like telling kyler murray he can't go home and play madden after he loses a game or wins a game or plays a game that's his thing okay all these players have to have a little bit of thing that they do that's oh you shouldn't be doing that that'll hurt your conditioning yeah well if i don't do it i will go insane let Manziel go party as long as it's not, you know, a flight to Vegas the day before a game. And then he just decides I'm going to throw on a disguise and skip my NFL game tomorrow. That's a little bit too much. And that's obviously why he got cut. But yeah, let the guy party. I think um, technology makes athletes better, but also makes them worse. And what I mean by that is this, and I'm, I'm sort of switching gears here, but okay, a good pair of running shoes will make you faster, but it'll also make your body weaker and slower. Um, so like technology and sports, there's a big debate. Well, not there, is a, there really isn't a big debate, but I think there should be more about where you draw the line um, with technology and sports. Like, if you can bench press 205 pounds with um, wrist braces on, but then you can only bench press 185 without wrist braces on, then what can you really bench? You know what I mean? If you can... I'm trying to think of another one. If you can high jump... Um, if you can high jump... Uh, a six foot bar wearing your high jump shoes, but then you throw on a pair of Converse and you can only high jump five foot eight, then what can you really high jump? So like, where do we draw the line with technology when it obviously improves our performance? Because steroids are banned. Steroids improve performance, but then so do batting gloves in baseball. So do cleats in baseball. All these little things that we allow in sports, but then there's other things that help that are not allowed. And obviously steroids, yeah, you're screwing up your body. That one's understandable. But uh, I know a few years ago, Nike um, manufactured a shoe like um, made to run a marathon in to try to get under like the under two hour marathon. That was very hard to get for everyone. No one could get it. And then the guy runs the marathon in that shoe and he runs it in under two hours. I think it was that Kipchoge guy or whatever his name is. But those shoes, obviously, and I think it was some kind of statistic they did after uh, he ran it. And it was like, yeah, this made him 3% faster, which doesn't sound like much, but 3% gave him a new world record broke the sub two hour marathon that was so inevitable or not inevitable that was so uh, elusive for so many runners but yeah he throws these shoes on and boom now it's broken so where do you draw the line if it if that one singular shoe can make a human run that whatever percent faster then where do you draw the line why doesn't nike start just throw some more of the propellant stuff in that shoe um, and make him go even faster. Where do you stop, right? Where does the hour and a half marathon come in where they just have jetpacks on their shoes? But, oh, these are legal. You know what I mean? 
And I, I think there was a big debate about banning those shoes from running. I don't know if it ever happened or whatever, but you know, and the more our technology gets better, the, the weaker our body gets too. Cause like if you, um, keep using that good technology, it's going to make it easier for you to run or do whatever other sport. And then your body becomes weaker because it's not being worked as hard, I guess. Obviously that's all very minute, but, um, there was like a Ted talk about this before, I think. And they were saying about how Jesse Owens, the sprinter back in like the thirties for the, uh, the U.S. Olympic team. He ran his 100-meter dash and won uh, in Berlin in 1936, I think. But he was running on a real old-school cinder track. He was running in gravel. And I forget if the guy said, like, if if you compensate the percentage difference in times between gravel, cinder track, and, like, a modern-day rubber track then like Jesse Owens would have been neck and neck with like Usain Bolt. I forget if that's exactly what he said, but it was something like that. And it's like, okay, who decided to make the rubber track? That's yet another thing that helps, but also it's like, okay, now we're erasing all the records before and we're going to make it all faster with this material. So obviously it's just sports. It doesn't matter that much. But uh, obviously sports are taken very seriously. And I'm surprised there's not more talk about that kind of stuff. You know, where's the sports league that just doesn't require any equipment at all? It's just you and your body doing whatever sport. Obviously for some, that would not be good. We don't want to play full-on tackle football um, with nothing on. All my rugby viewers... Uh, just got really mad at me for saying that. Rugby's pretty hardcore. But, you know, you can't use it for every sport. But or there might be some demand for that. Just like the naked and afraid sports team. You don't even get clothes. Okay, you got to play the sport completely naked. No technology. Okay, just letting it all hang out. So... People would watch. People would 100% watch. So, but anyway, yeah. So, back to Johnny Manziel. Um, and I'm going to get into the last little topic here today. But Johnny Manziel had really great spatial awareness in the pocket. Uh, but not everyone does. Some people have zero spatial awareness, and I cannot stand it. Um, I learned this mostly while working in a grocery store. I've worked at Walmart before, too, okay? If you see a person just pushing their car down an aisle, and then they walk away from the cart to go grab something off the shelf, and they leave the cart smack dab in the middle of the aisle while there's other people there they don't push it to the side you can assume that person does not have great spatial awareness and i'm not talking about uh sitting in the cart there for five seconds while you grab something i'm talking they want to go look at the cereal box the back of the cereal box for 10 minutes okay they have to read the ingredients they have to make sure it's gluten-free they have to find out who owns the parent company so that whatever, uh, you know, whatever, um, you know, whenever I hit record on this podcast, my, my brain melts. My brain melts. They have to figure out who owns the cereal company uh, so that they can keep following their boycott that they're doing that month, whichever one it may be. So, and the whole time their cart is sitting in the middle of the aisle there's other people trying to get through. They have no clue. Now, that person either has no spatial awareness or they're just, they don't care about other people. But, you know, these are the types of people that 
if we were still cavemen, they would, they would live for maybe 20 minutes. Maybe 20 minutes. Maybe 30. It depends where they are on Earth. Okay. People that would walk right into the tiger's den. People that would not hear the 800-pound grizzly bear stalking behind them through thick brush. Um, and that sounds really mean. But until you put in hundreds of hours in the grocery store and watch people do this, I don't want to hear it. I need to get that off my chest. I need to get it off my chest. Okay? If we were cavemen, they wouldn't be around too long, I don't think. Or they would at least be very heavily demoted in the caveman tribe. Okay? These would not be our leaders. Um, but anyway, cavemen times were interesting. I think it's interesting that we have cave paintings and I think it's interesting that they look so terrible. Why is every cave painting awful? It's always like a stick figure. They're terrible. And I have a theory about this. Okay. I think that the people that made cave paintings were trying to do it in secret. They were rushing because if anyone found them doing their cute little hobby in the cave, then they would be called a nerd. They would be called a nerd, I think. Okay, while everyone's out hunting and gathering food, right, and the other people are nursing babies, they're foraging, they're doing all these productive things, and then there's some hairy caveman sneaking off in the corner to do his little hobby, to paint a picture of him supposedly killing a buffalo. Yeah. Yeah. Nerd. Nerd alert. Are you kidding me? Nerd alert. Okay. The reason why cave paintings look so bad is because they were rushing to get done so fast so they wouldn't be caught doing their cute little art while other people hunt for bison So they rush, and obviously it doesn't look great when you rush, and many of them are unfinished because they get caught in the act, they get called a nerd, and they probably get roasted up that night and eaten or something. Okay, the reason why art didn't get good until like the last few hundred years isn't because we had better technology to make paintings and sculptures and all these things. Uh, It's actually because people finally started letting the nerds uh, put in their details before they were killed. Now, obviously, I'm joking. It's all a bit. I don't think artists are nerds, guys. It's all a joke. It's all a stupid bit. But, you know, when, when Michelangelo was painting the Sistine Chapel, he would paint one brushstroke and then look around in fear. Because he didn't want to be called a nerd. And he did not want to get killed for being a nerd. Okay? That's why every painting took so long. Now, obviously, they're masterpieces. But one brushstroke at a time and then look around to make sure nobody heard. So, if you get heard, you'll be called a nerd. That's the rule. Um, but, you know, it's sort of like when SpongeBob was waiting on the bus to get out of rock bottom... And he's just trying to get a candy bar out of the vending machine. And every time he reaches in to grab it, the bus pulls up. Okay, it's like that. One brush stroke, and there's someone peeking in to call you a nerd. You have to hide your hand and act like you didn't do it. So, um, but yeah. Um, I'm not going to sit here and act like I would have been okay as a caveman. Can you imagine what those guys would have done if I go, you know, I want to start a podcast. And they go, what's that? And I go, oh, it's just a thing where I just talk about dumb stuff on the internet and random stuff and other people listen to it. And they would probably stone me to death and then cook me for dinner. Okay. The art just didn't fly back then. The art just didn't fly. So I, I would not have been any better. I would have been a nerd with the artist's. They would tell me to go hunt a bison. Okay. Would not have turned out good. 
But anyway, I think that's about going to wrap up our show today. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Like, follow, subscribe, text your friends, the link. Do all that cool stuff. Going to go back, hopefully, to weekly episodes here. Uh, I'm all moved in. I'm ready to get back on the horse, ready to keep going. Going to try to balance school as well as the podcast and just keep the ball rolling. So see you guys next week. I believe I got a couple of guests on for next week. So um, we'll see you then.